Good to be here tonight. Amen? Amen. And I'm proud to be an American. I'm kind of pumped over that Trump speech last night. Just be, just be honest with you. I'm a little pumped over it. Uh, the only person who uh, bashed America last night was uh, Joe Kennedy afterward. And he made it sound like America... You all right there, bud? He made it sound like America was going down the toilet at any moment now. And what infuriated me last night, Joe Kennedy said this. Uh, what infuriated me was he said that if we build that wall, his people are going to tear it down. That's called illegal. Okay? That's against the law to tear down federal government property. I'm being dead serious. That made me angry. Um, I could preach a message tonight on family protection, border protection, church protection, Christian protection, and it all involves a wall. You can take, I'm preaching, you could take, do I have my microphone on? My microphone on? Yeah, it was. You can take, um, the story of those guys after they came back from Babylonian captivity, their first priority when they came back and they saw the desolation in Jerusalem, what was their number one priority? Rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. Why? Because their enemies were going to be after them. And it was their enemies who came in like they were all like, oh, we worship the same God as you do, just a different name. Why don't you help us build the wall with you? And they said, uh, no, this is our wall. He's our God. You don't worship the same God as we do. Now go away and we'll build our... See, what was going to happen was they were going to get involved in it and shut it down. Walls are salvation in the Bible. Can I get somebody to say amen? Okay, walls are salvation. And if you're going to save a soul, if you're going to save a family... If you're going to save a nation, you're going to save a church, you build a wall around it. And you don't let the devil start putting breaches everywhere. Amen? And that, to me, it just, it, it's treacherous, which means they're a traitor, to their nation for wanting to destroy a safety wall that will not allow bad people into our country. It's treacherous. To say that you don't want that or that you want it destroyed once it's in place. I'm not, I'm not in favor of Joe Kennedy's speech, by the way, nor Bernie Sanders' speech. He was on YouTube last night talking about how we need to make everybody's pay exactly the same and we need full government takeover of all business and industry in the United States of America because it's worked well in Cuba, the Soviet Union, Venezuela. Okay, North Korea, it works very well in all those places, so we need to institute it immediately here in America. Okay, um, huh? Give these people a Bible and tell them to read it and take it seriously and they might learn a few things. Amen? I'm going to do things backward tonight. Get your Bible out. Amen? Um, Oh, yeah, by the way, Michael is picking his mom up from the airport right now, and John's running the camera. Yeah. I, I finally got a text, John. I'm, John's up there going, yeah, I'm running the camera tonight. I said, where's Michael? He's picking his mom up from the airport. Really? His mom? I didn't know. Uh, take your Bible, and uh, let's go to, um, we're talking about, Christ, the head of all the offices. Did you bring a Bible tonight? That's good. You need it. Okay? Um, and if you have two, send one to Bernie Sanders and Nancy Pelosi. And all the Congress, all the, that congressman, whoever it was, that when they were chanting, USA, USA, he got up and ran out because it offended him. He's a United States congressman. And he, and he ran out offended in tears 
because they were chanting USA, USA, USA. He should be fired, up, fired at on the spot or fired on the spot. I'm not, I'm not nice about enemies of our country inside of our country. I'm not nice about it. The people who are sworn to office are sworn to protect not the American people, not their own jobs. They're sworn to protect the Constitution against all enemies where? Foreign and what, Mike? Domestic. We have domestic enemies of the Constitution of the United States just like we have domestic enemies of the Bible in churches. I'm going to stir you guys up tonight before we get out of here, okay? Like I am. I, ain't, I am fired up. I ain't kidding you. I watched that last night, and I could not believe that we actually have a politician speaking right, okay? We, we, ha we actually have that guy in office now, and I'm tickled to death. All right, uh, take your Bible where I want you to go first. Let's go to Psalm, and uh, we're going to work our way through. This is Christ, or God, as judge. Um, everybody, and th this, this is along the, uh, we're in first Peter and this is, uh, going along with Christ, our, our, our chief shepherd and bishop of our souls. And, uh, this is the offices that, that Jesus Christ holds. He is the, he is, um, uh, what have we studied so far? He's the bishop. He's the shepherd. What else? High priest. What else? The high priest, yeah. Chief cornerstone, that's a good one. Had, I don't have that one in there. The, yeah, the chief apostle. And uh, now we're looking at, at God as judge. And I made some notes here. Um, actually, before church started tonight, I added some things to it as if we didn't have enough. But I never have enough of the Bible. Amen? Psalm 7, verse 8. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to think of this in terms of who judges your life. Who judges over your life, okay? When people say it's not, you're not supposed to judge anybody or anything, what they mean by that is allow me to sin however I want to and you're not to have any opinion of it whatsoever other than Leave me alone and don't say anything about what I'm doing wrong. That's what people mean by that. While they themselves judge everybody around them, they don't want you judging them over what they do. And to be honest, church people are bad about it. We are bad about laying judgment on people. It's something that we, it's part of our flesh. It's part of our wicked nature. We have to work against it. But we have remedies in the scripture for us as Bible believers over how our life is to be examined by Jesus Christ, the judge, there are times and situations where others are allowed to judge over us and to examine us and say, what you're doing is not right. Let me give you an example. Christ gave us the situation of, if, if you see a brother overtaken in fault, if you see someone that has, has, a, has committed an offense, you're to go to them privately first. And you're to say to them, I saw what you did, I have first-hand knowledge of what you did, or I heard something that you did, verify if it's true or not, and if it's not true, we'll go from there. Or if you say it's not true, we'll go from there. But I saw what you did, I know what you did, let me show you from the Bible where this is wrong. Now I'm not coming here to just throw stones and get it over with. The idea of it at that first meeting was restoration. Restoration of a believer, if they are in fact a believer. Restoration of them. Forgiveness. Repentance. It's over with. And in that case, in that situation, it requires judgment. It requires someone saying, this is what you did, this is what the Bible says, and it's not right. If that doesn't go anywhere, you bring a second witness in. Still done privately, still done out of respect and love and admonition, wanting to restore that person in favor. Okay, I've, I've done this with people. I've had it done with me. 
People have come to me. Pastor, I need to talk to you. Or Mike, I need to talk to you for a minute. Usually, a lot of times, it was my mother. Son, what was you doing? Okay. But there's always judgment, and it is allowed if it's done right. And the Bible gives us the conditions. So as you're going through these verses, think of God being your primary judge. And we know and we trust Christ that he always judges righteously. He always does it in truth. He always does it, number one, Christ always balances God's judicial requirements with the promise of mercy if you meet the qualifications for that mercy. Christ balances those always. That's his job. Psalm 7, verse 8, The Lord shall judge the people, and then judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to mine integrity that is in me. Pay attention to what this verse says. So you are saying to God, God, you always judge me. God, you always watch over my life. You, God, if I step out of line, you come tell me about it. God, if I've done wickedly, you come and get me for it. God, do not allow me to get away with anything that violates your word. Come and get me, Lord. Somebody say amen. Okay? I guess starting this thing backwards got you all messed up. Okay? You'll, serve, you'll save the amens for later. But anyway, judge me, O Lord. Now watch this. According to my righteousness... Whose righteousness are you not trying to get? Uh, let, let me kind of, I'm saying this the wrong way. When you're asking God to judge you, do not say, God judge me based upon what they did. Based upon what they say, or how they see it, or how I was raised, or whatever. Do not judge me, God, based upon what everybody else is doing, and what everybody else says is right. God, judge me according to what I did, according to my righteousness, or lack thereof, and according to mine integrity that is in me. I don't want to be judged based upon what's popular. I don't want to be judged by God based upon what somebody else says is a sin. Let me ask you a, let me ask you a question. Is not going to church on Wednesday night a sin? No. No, we have the scripture to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner. But there is no list nor schedule in scripture of how many times we're to have service, how many times you are required to attend. There's nothing like that in the scripture. So if somebody said, well, you missed three Wednesdays, I, I just don't think that's right. I think I think that's I don't think that's right. I think you need to repent of that now. Your reasons for not being there may not have been right. But is it necessarily a sin against God that you didn't attend church some Wednesday night? The answer is no. Sin is a transgression of God's law. Okay? And as far as laws is concerned, God didn't even tell us concerning the Sabbath day that we had to meet together and have a service on the Sabbath day. God never, did not say that anywhere in the scriptures. And yet you have the whole... Seventh-day Adventist movement based upon the idea that if you're not going to a church service on Saturday You have the mark of the beast on you. That's how far they carry that nonsense That is judgment based upon something that Ellen White came up with and not what God said Okay, so according to my righteousness according to my integrity that is in me When I want God to judge me, I want God to judge me based upon what I did or did not do and for God to judge me based upon what his word says. Not what somebody else said. Not what somebody else wants. And not, what's, not what everybody else does. But upon what God said and upon what I did. Verse 11. God judgeth the righteous. Watch this now. God is angry with the wicked every day. I'm going to throw something else in here. Is it a sin to be angry? Is it a sin to be angry? No. It is not a sin to be angry. Uh, I had a conversation with somebody this week, and they were, really, they were really down on themselves because they said that they are having feelings of anger. And 
they know that's a sin. And I said, no, let me, let me help you with something. Having the feeling of anger is not a sin. What you do with it. Okay? The Bible says be angry and sin not. It does not say it is a sin to be angry. It says be angry, sin not. Okay? You, sometimes you cannot choose your emotions. You can, however, choose your reaction to those emotions. And sometimes it takes a little personal discipline, sometimes a little training. Back when you were lost and you hit your thumb, what'd you say? What'd you do? Okay? But now that you're saved, those feelings don't go away. You're still going to hit your thumb. Okay? Or as Ron Dagonia used to say, it's not bad to hit your thumb with that drywall hammer. What's bad is when you hit it twice in the same day with a drywall hammer. That's bad. Done it. Okay? Um, anyway, when you're angry, condition, train yourself, do whatever it takes to not sin based upon that anger. Amen? Okay? Judge yourself on that issue or let God judge you on that issue. Some people deal with anger problems. Some people, it is a legitimate issue in their life. It controls them. It's something that they just can't, I mean, they just can't get, you know, the, the anger never goes away. That's, that's like saying a, a, a drunk is an alcoholic and they have an issue with alcohol and it just... You know, when they drink, it just does th something in them that it doesn't do in other people. I understand that. That's still not an excuse to drink. Still not an excuse to go get drunk. Okay? In fact, it's more of a reason to stay away from that nasty stuff and don't touch it again because it does have that effect on you. Okay? That means cold medicine, bourbon chicken, Stay away from it, amen? Uh, I, listen, I know people who are alcoholics. They don't take NyQuil. They don't swallow any kind of medicine with alcohol in it. They don't eat restaurant food or dishes that have been cooked in alcohol. It triggers a response in them that they cannot control, okay? So what do they do? Stay away from it. If, the, if you can't control the response, you can control whether or not you get to that point or not. Anyway, back to the judgment issue. God judges the righteous. God is angry with the wicked every day, meaning that God judges every human being on planet Earth every single day. And God is, as He judges His own people first. Where does judgment begin? House of God. Notice the order here. God judgeth the righteous. That's because it is God's responsibility. If they are His people, it is God's responsibility to judge His own house first. And the qualifications for bishop. This is something, a lesson that I had to learn. I thought that when I got out of Bible college, I was instantaneously ready to be in the full-time ministry. And God said, no, you're not. Because there's a qualification there. I had to learn how to rule my own house well. Because if a man cannot rule his own house, how can he then oversee the house of God? And I was missing that part. But that's a serious issue. If a man is not going to judge over his own house and rule it right, how then, because that's his first responsibility, how then can he judge and rule over God's people and do it right? Okay? And I, listen, I know a lot of preachers. And I know some of them who are the worst dads, worst husbands in the world. Does that have an effect on their ministry? You bet it does. It absolutely does. So God took me and said, Mike, you got to get this right first. We're going to train you at home first. We're going to put some training wheels on you at home. Okay? So God judges the righteous. That's his first condition, his first priority. Secondly, God is angry with the wicked every day. Why? He's already judged them. He's judged them. They're already guilty. 
and they are awaiting sentencing up in heaven. God's judgment is already passed, and he is angry with them because of their unrighteousness, because of their wickedness, and God has the right to do that. They're his people. Everybody in the earth is a subject of the kingdom of God. That means everybody's under his authority, whether they want to be a liberal or an atheist or whatever, and not believe in God or have a belief in God that doesn't affect them in any way, it doesn't matter. They're breathing God's air. They're living on God's land. They're eating God's food. God's blood is pumping through their veins. God, God's book of DNA is in their cells. God owns them. And God has a right to be angry. Psalm 9 verse 4. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou satest in the throne judging right. Now here's another. I'm going to throw this in and we'll move on. Uh, let's read verse 8 along with that. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Two things God's going to do. Number one, when he judges, he's going to do it in righteousness. And he's going to do it in uprightness, which means integrity. Nobody's going to be able to lay blame against God and say, God, you allowed, um, you allowed Sodom, or no, you allowed Israel to get away with this, and yet you judged Sodom for the same thing. You see what I'm saying? Jesus said, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than it will be for, what do you say, Tyre and Sidon? In the places where he tried to do miracles and they wouldn't believe, Jesus said it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than it's going to be for you. And the idea is when God judges uprightly, that means that what the wicked do and are punished for, if God's own people do it and go unpunished, well, that's not right, is it? It's favoritism. If a judge had... Convictions in his court, drug, uh, drug addicts, um, wife abusers, um, thieves, thugs, everything else, and yet some of his own family members or some people of friends of his and their, their kids came in his courtroom and he allowed them to get away with what he judged other people with, he's not judging uprightly. So we are the people of God. We are his first priority. And I know what bugs me. Doctrinal positions that allow church people to get away with literally murder. And yet, everybody else gets judged harshly by God. Simply because in their church, the way they believe, you're saved and nothing you do can ever affect your salvation in any way, shape, or form. You can do whatever you want to and you can still go to heaven. That's not right. There's even churches who take that to an extreme and say, we don't believe that God ever even chastises us as his children. Excuse me. You're a bastard. That's what, that's what Hebrews 12 says. If you will not allow God to chastise you, that's the name that God puts on you. And yet, and these are, the, the term is hyper-dispensationalist. They believe that only Paul's writings apply to them. Everything else in the Bible does not apply to them. So they can literally, a church in Bristol, Tennessee, Bristol, Virginia, that's the town, literally has state line across the street. King James pastor, I've told you this, King James pastor, hyper-dispensationalist, raping children in that church, okay? Getting away with it in his eyes because God doesn't chastise him. He's in prison right now, serving a 60-year sentence, something like that. I think God judged him or... The judgment's yet to come. Okay? God has maintained my right and cause. Thou saidest in the throne judging right. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. God will always do it in integrity every single time. God doesn't play favors. 
Psalm 9, 16, the Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. How, how's that right? Say amen. So let's, let's compare our God with Allah. Allah wants Allah's men to marry girls at a young age. Because Muhammad did. Muhammad married girls five years old. Um, it is right in Islam for the men to rape the women. It's right. Okay? Well, if the women are not Muslim, then it's okay for Muslim men to rape non-Muslim women because they're infidels. Okay? Let's compare our God with their God. Okay? In Islam... It is holy and right to burn, cut open, blow up, murder women, children, men of every race, every nationality, every creed, as long as they're not Muslim. If they're not Muslim, it's okay to murder them, to rape them, to cut them open, to blow them up, to do whatever you want to, to take their money. It's okay to do that. In Islam, it is okay to murder your own daughter. There was a case, this goes back to the 80s. The FBI was listening in on a Muslim man in the St. Louis area. They had his phone tapped. His daughter ended up missing. And they wanted to know why. Jared, you remember this. They found his daughter, found her body. She had been murdered. They did the investigation. It didn't take them long because the FBI had the tapes of his phone calls. They were recording his house as he murdered his own daughter for the crime of having a crush on a non-Muslim boy at their school. He willingly murdered his own daughter saying to her, die, my precious daughter. That was recorded, okay? That's an animal. Compare our God, the Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth, to their God. So don't tell me that having Muslim immigrants in this nation benefits our nation. I don't care if they're not extremists or terrorists. Their own religion says that whatever you want to do to a non-Muslim is okay. And they live and die by their own creed to their own God. Coming to this nation does not change that. Amen? Okay? The Lord is known by the judgment which he ex... I'm trying to pop my neck. Hang on. Ugh. There we go. Did you hear that? That was a good one. Okay? The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. It's Proverbs 17, 23, look here. Wicked man taketh the gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. You understand that, don't you? J.R., come here. We're going to illustrate. You guys on the back row, pay attention to this. You'll need this. You'll need to know this one of these days. Okay? J.R. is a judge. Okay? And there's fixing to be a uh, situation where my son is going to end up in his courtroom, okay? Because my son did something terrible, whatever, and I'm going to let him get by with it. So what I do is, hey, Jr., how's it going, buddy? Okay, hey, how's it going? There, there okay, here we go. And he takes a gift, okay? That's what that means, a gift out of the bosom, meaning a hidden gift that is intended to persuade his judgment, okay? Thank you, Jr. Um, Pastor Kelly preached a real good message on this years ago about it, about uh, bribes and gifts, and even how people in churches will use gifts to their pastor in order to sway his judgment. I'll give you an example of it. A man that I personally know, pastor, if I gave you the name, you'd know it. He took a church down in uh, South Carolina, pretty good-sized church. They had some good money. And uh, the, the former pastor in there, I don't know what they were used to, but when this 
young man went in to pastor that church. I mean, he brought in evangelistic style of preaching. Uh, he preached hellfire and brimstone. He preached right out of the King James Bible. I mean, it was something. It was a breath of fresh air to this church. And a lot of people in the church were really in favor of this guy. And, this, and what he was saying, he was preaching against sin. He was preaching against their sin. When he got to the church, uh, he, didn't, he didn't want to put his children in public school. He was either going to homeschool or try to find Christian school for them. And there was a Christian school there in that area. And he was going to put his children, I think he had three children, he was going to put his children in that Christian school. And a man out of the church stepped forward and said, Pastor, I want to pay for all three of your children. I'm going to pay the year's tuition up front for all your children to go to that school. Pastor is flabbergasted. Paying him a really good salary. He's got good benefits. I mean, everything is going well. Treasurer comes to him about a, about a year or so after he's there. Treasurer comes to him. He notices that there's something not right in the books. And says, for some reason, we have money, $100,000 being donated at the beginning of the year by a certain man. And over the course of the year, checks are going out in various amounts back to this man. So he looked and saw what was going on. Uh, the man owned several pharmacies in the area, a wealthy man. Same man that paid for his kid's tuition. Called the uh, Christian Law Association, got their opinion on it. Called Jay Seculo and his law association, got their opinion on it. Both of them said, whoever's doing this is laundering money through your church. He's washing money in your church. And if the IRS gets involved in it, you and everybody who's officers in that church are in big trouble. Because the assumption is, you ought to know about it, it's going on, and you need to do something about it. If you don't do something about it, then you're complicit in it. So he called the man, he said, I, I need to meet with you, I need to have a meeting with you. The guy said, sure. So he sat down with him, he, and he showed him the books, he showed him what was going on. And he told him, he said, now I've done called some lawyers. And he said, this amounts to money laundering. And he said, it's not right. He said, I wanted to bring it to you personally. So that you can understand. He said, I want to hear from you. And the guy said, well, you know, what I do is I pay for a lot of people's prescriptions who don't have the money to afford medicine. And he said, this is the way I do it. I write a check to the church. And any time that I have to pay somebody's prescription, then the church gives me a check back for that amount. And he said, I'm doing it because, you know, these people, it's, you know, I'm doing it for them. And when the $100,000 of that money went through, he donated another, same year. And he said, well, he said, I'm just telling you, this is money laundering. We have to put a stop to it. We can't continue to do this anymore. And the guy leaned back and he said, I thought you were smarter than this. He said, what do you mean? He said, you come in here with all that preaching about sin and all that stuff. He said, I'm about headed up to here with it. And he said, you got your kids going to Christian school. That's all paid for. You're making a pretty good salary package. Got everything paid for. Why aren't you like the former pastor? Why don't you just take the money and preach some sermons and let us run the church affairs? He said, I can't do that. And he said, well, you're not going to be around here long. And that guy was not on a single board in that church. But he had family members that were. He had family members that were on every board. It's one of these churches where they had a board for light bulbs screwing in. Okay, I mean, they, some churches have boards for everything. And this man had a family member or somebody he controlled on every board in that church. And he went around behind the scenes trying to get those boards to throw that pastor out. And it finally came down to a big, big meeting in the church. And the pastor decided, I'm not going to put my family through this. We're leaving. And some good people stood up and said, the moment he leaves, you'll see the last of us here. We're never coming back to this place. You run that man of God out of here and the way he's been preaching and what he's trying to put a stop to in this church you run him out, we're going with him, we're never coming back. God's going to write Ichabod over this place. So he left, 
And sure enough, that man still retains his behind-the-scenes workings in that church. Okay? That man in that church wanted the pastor to accept his gifts and carry his favor along with those gifts. Okay? Now, I love you. I don't know what you give. I don't want to know what you give. I don't care what you give. I don't care if you give or don't give. That's between you and God and Rose, okay, and the IRS, okay? That includes everybody on the other side of that camera because I made a deal with God when I put the first video online. God, I do not want anybody to donate a nickel to this place and think that because of that, they have special access to me. It doesn't work that way. And I've had people write me letters saying, I donate to your ministry and you won't do this and you won't do that. I'm sorry, the moment you said that, I'm done. Okay, don't ask me for anything else. Don't tell me you donate and then tell me you want something out of me. Okay, because it doesn't work. It's not right. Because I have to go stand... For my judgment over this church, I have to go stand before the judge, okay? And uh, it just doesn't work that way. So Proverbs 18, 5, it is not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment. Over, to accept the person of the wicked. You know what that means? Just to take somebody's favor because of their, let's say they're standing in the church, or they're standing in the community, or they're standing in the lodge. A pastor friend of mine, he had a deacon. He was pastoring a church in Oklahoma. He had a deacon that was the worshipful master of the Mason Lodge in that town. And he got a call one day, and he said, Pastor, I need you to, need you to come meet me at my lawyer's office. The lawyer was in that man's Masonic Lodge. Pastor said, what's going on? He said, we'll explain it when we get down to the lawyer's office. He got down there. His son was, was with a couple other boys on a weekend, and they's out drinking, and uh, teenagers, older teenagers, they's out drinking, running around, got into a fight with somebody, and beat them so bad that they died. And nobody was stepping forward to claim responsibility for the fight or anything like that. And this worshipful master's son was in on it. And the pastor told me, he said, I was in the office when the phone call was made. He said, we got to this lawyer's office. Here's this worshipful master of the lodge and the lawyer. And they called, I don't know if they called the judge or the prosecutor, one of the two. And because they was all members of the Masonic Lodge, that boy's deal was cut and dried right then and there in that lawyer's office. He got a slap on the wrist for testifying against the other two, and the other two boys went down hard. And what happened was, because these men were members of the lodge, they were accepting the person over this, the innocent who had been killed. They were accepting the person of this man's status in the Masonic Lodge, and by the way, this is done a lot. I was uh, with somebody at a court proceeding one morning. It was an early morning, it was a 9 o'clock deal. All the lawyers are, you know, together talking. They're talking with the prosecutor. They're all having a good time, this and that and the other. Then it's time for the judge to come in, and they all kind of straighten up a little bit. And all the town lawyers, you know, I could pick them out because they were all with the prosecutor, you know, talking this and that and the other. But... An out-of-town, probably from St. Louis somewhere, one of these big shot uh, young attorneys come down, nice suit, nice shoes. He obviously was not known in that courtroom or in that courthouse among the prosecutor and those other lawyers and that judge. So he comes in wearing his Masonic square and compass lapel pin. And the Holy Ghost said, Mike, look at that. And I went, I get it. I get it. This man was going to use the favoritism of the lodge for whatever his client was up against. He was going to use the favoritism of the lodge to get his client a better deal than he would have gotten without it. 
And if you don't think it goes, if you don't think it goes along in this country, it does. It's hard and heavy, especially in the areas of the South where Masonic and the oddball lot, what was the odd fellow? Oddball, the odd fellows, and other lodges curry favor and use their influence in the courts to get their way. You think it takes place in Washington, D.C.? Bet your bottom dollar it does. Proverbs 18, 5, It is not good to accept the person of the wicked. Proverbs 24, 23, These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to have respective persons in judgment. Do you think judges look upon the color of somebody's skin in a courtroom? Do you think that happens? Sure it does. Do you think God cares? No. Not on the least bit. Israel's biggest problem when Jesus came around was they were using their racial um, heritage as a way to position themselves closer with God than anybody else in the world was. So I uh, should think about this now. Here's these Jews that are so highly favored with God, they're under Roman tyranny. That's how, that's how God favors them. God put them under cruel authority under Rome. And you had one Roman emperor after another slaughtering Jews. Eventually, 40 years later, the Roman emperor was going to burn the whole town of Jerusalem down, including their temple. That's how much God favored the Jews at that time. But they saw themselves as being high up with God, because what did they say? We be sons of Abraham. And Jesus said what? Or was it John the Baptist? God is able to these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. God does not care what race you are. God does not care whose, whose father you were, whose, or whose, who your daddy was, who your mama was, who your, what heritage you came from, what family last name. Do you think the Queen of England has a better chance of getting in the pearly gates than you and I do? Not a chance. Her crown means nothing to God in his judgment. Not a thing. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. That is something to keep in mind in your daily life. How many of you ever looked at somebody and misjudged them? <laughs> I've heard that. It happens all the time. Now, I'm going to be honest about something. Appearance speaks and i'm being honest appearance speaks okay but sometimes it doesn't tell the whole truth so it's always good to hear a matter to hear someone to find out who they are what they're made of where they came from what they're doing what they believe what they stand for it's good on that okay and uh Anyway, let's, I got, let's, let me cover this very quick. I'm going to set you up for next week, all right? Next week, I'm going to throw something at you real hard, okay? Who's ever heard of the judgment seat of Christ? Who's ever heard of that? Raise your hand, okay? What is it? Does anybody know? Does anybody know what the judgment seat of Christ is? Anybody? Huh? No, say, go ahead and say, you, okay, you've heard this preached a lot, okay? I know your background a little bit, and I know where you've heard it from, okay? Who is the judgment seat of Christ for? Is it only for Christians, or is it for everybody? Wow, you really believe that? You going to stick to that? I'll give, you a, I'll give you a clue here, okay? There it is. You see that? John 5. Okay. Anyway, I had heard all my life that the judgment, they, these guys like to say the Bema seat. Now, I have no idea where in the world they dug that out of. Find the word Bema in the King James Bible. Okay. N not Beavis. Yeah. <laughs> Bema, B-E-M-A, okay? I think it must be Greek or something. But I had heard that the judgment seat of Christ, and I'll, I'll just throw it out to you. 
Those who believe that once you pray the prayer of salvation, you're instantaneously and forever saved, and nothing changes that. When it comes to people who end up dying, as my favorite term is atheist, lesbian, witches. When they end up dying in that state, those who hold that position say, yes, they are saved, yes, they are in heaven, but they are at the judgment seat of Christ, and Christ is judging all of their works, so that if they don't have the works, let's say that I do, then they don't receive the rewards in heaven that I am going to get. Okay? Now you can tell I already disdain this notion, having studied it for myself. Do you know what my reward is in heaven? I have one reward. Do you know what it is? What is it? Getting there? <laughs> Yes, Caleb. Uh huh. What is my reward in heaven? You're close. More specifically, what God told Abraham Abraham, I am thy exceeding and great reward. God is. God is my reward. Okay? And you can apply, you know, eternal life, being in his presence, actually getting to see his face, that all goes with it. But my reward is the Lord. There's nothing else that you can give me or take away from me that's going to trump that. Okay? Nothing. Okay? I do not believe that you are going to get 60 more rooms in your mansion than she is because... You stayed in church more and you had a greater church attendance than she did. I don't buy it. Mike? It's a setup. It's a lie. What esoteric group teaches levels? Okay. That's, that's where I'm going. And it's going to be controversial. I already got people who hate my guts, so I don't care. Okay. But we're going to study the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, we're going to study it from the Bible. Isaiah 33, 22, and I'm going to close with this, and then we're going to have a prayer time. Our Constitution was founded upon Isaiah 33, 22. Look at it. Read it. What does it say? You're not there, are you? Isaiah 33, 22. Look up on the screen. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. You have a three-tiered form of government right here, okay? In the United States of America, the Constitution provides for the judicial branch, the Lord is our judge, the legislative branch, the Lord is our lawgiver, the executive branch, the Lord is our king, okay? That's where they got it from. They didn't get it from the book of Koran or the Roman Catholic Church. They got it from Isaiah 33, 22, okay? Jesus Christ is our judge but is he not the judge of lost people as well read john 5 okay read john 5